Hey everyone, welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon and this is the Breaking Free Show. And I'm so happy to be here with you today and to have you here with us today. It's a really great day. We have a great show in store and I'm like holding back the tears already. So before we get started and before I introduce my guests, because we have three of very special honored people here with us today, I'm going to say hi to Amnon. You, Hello, Marilyn. How are you? I'm good. And how are you? I'm just fine. Did you have a nice weekend? It, it was a beautiful weekend. Yes. Work, work. Worked hard on Saturday, but yeah. it was great weather. It was lovely. Today is kind of... Yuck. Yeah, it, but, it was yeah. lovely, lovely, lovely. And just... Uh, I went on a hike yesterday, by the way, and I love hiking when it's in the elements. I like hiking in the rain, in the snow, in the sleet, when it's blowing. And I just... My, it was sopping wet, but I had a great time. Hike. So now, <laughs> thank you. Everybody needs an omnum with a little sense of humor. Okay, so here we go. Ready for the show. I want to remind everybody that you are more than welcome anytime during the show to call in, comment, ask a question, whatever you like. We're here. Please feel free to come into our chat. You can put your name right under our um, video. You can put your nickname, your name, and you can ask questions. You can comment there as well. You can call in any time on a phone, 919-518-9773, or from anywhere in the world, you can come in on Skype Voice, and that would be at Computers 2K Voice. Computers, that's plural, the number 2K Voice. So here we go. For several months, for maybe ongoing for the last year or so, we have had these th are my guests coming up now individually they have been each on our show and each of them have an amazing holocaust story and today we're going to share a little bit about that story and who they are but we're really going to go into what are they doing now what have they accomplished and because so many of us have come from diversity uh, things that have happened in our world, adversity, whatever it is, we we have fears, we have pains, we have tragedies, and yet we do come through it. And what craziness occurred during the Holocaust, right? I mean, things that you were so real that you can't even look at and go, did that really happen? And yes, it did. So my three guests, however, are extremely special. They have their story, but they're not just living their story. So I want to introduce first Gabriella Kovac, who's coming from Australia. Hey, good morning to you, Gabriella. Good morning there, Madeline. How are you? I'm um, good. Considering it's like 5 a.m. in the morning there, you look quite lovely. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> it's lovely to have you. It is. Yes. What were you going to say? Well, it's, it, it's an interesting time. I was just saying for everybody else who's listening to this show, it is very humid and it's 28 degrees. Oof. So, exactly right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, you look beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. My pleasure. And next we have Jack Cooper. Hey, Jack, all the way from Canada. How you doing, Jack? Hi. Hi. How are you? I am fine. Thank you. I, uh, yeah. Good. It's good to have you here. Thank you very much. And Leon, where are you now, yeah. Leon? Yes, I am actually in Big Sky, Montana, where I came here to ski for the week and uh, to be with you before uh, giving up a beautiful uh, morning of skiing. Woo. But it is a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. So, Gabriella, why don't you just give us a, 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 a little bit of a context? of your Holocaust story? Well, my Holocaust story is really a story about my mother and the way she had this amazing bringing up by her father on believing that she was in a magic bubble. And therefore, she overcame most of the Holocaust, which is some people may like it and some people just unbelievable, but the troll is true. And uh, I find that from after a while, I've realized that it's something that I must tell everyone because in today's world, we still have our own problems in life. And since I know the secrets of what she's done, I feel that it is my 
duty really to tell everyone about it and inform everyone that there is a way through and it's an inspirational way of handling your life even today. And that's what it, that's why I've done the book. And now, actually, I've changed the cover of the book. I forgot to tell you that. Oh, yeah? Yeah, this is the new cover. I'll just put it up for you, if you like. That's that's it there. Georgina. That's Perfect. Oh, it's beautiful. Cover. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And now Thank I'm uh, doing a lot of inspirational speaking about telling people about how you can overcome your own adversities in life and just use it and and just be in the magic bubble that my mother was in. So well, sometimes sometimes we have to go in that bubble or be that bubble to me. I mean, I exactly. often say, uh, you know, life looks a lot better out of rosy glasses. Yes. Right. And we make it's some different happen. choices. Yeah. So let let me go to Leon now who actually found, found, didn't, wasn't looking for me. Leon was looking for Gabriella and, and contacted me because somebody told him about her book. And when he researched her book, <laughs> he found me and the fact that she had been on my show, he was not looking for me. However, when we found each other, we found something special. So Leon, why don't you share some about yourself? I was born in uh, 1937 in France, uh, in a town called Compiègne, about uh, uh, 40 miles north of Paris. The war was declared in uh, 1940. Nothing much happened in until uh, 1941. And uh, the town where I was born hosted the armistices of uh, World War I and World War II. And Hitler, as a revenge, decided to actually bomb uh, this, our city. And about 3,000 buildings were, uh, were destroyed. And he came uh, in his uh, opened uh, Mercedes uh, limo and uh, participated in the signature of the armistice. And of course, the world thought that it was a true armistice, but that was only the start of the war. Shortly after the invasion of uh, France, of Compiègne in particular, uh, that uh, we, the, the Germans, uh, the SS uh, came in, invaded the town. Uh, Compiègne was a very strategic town because it had a, a railroad, uh, a railroad uh, network that started actually from Compiègne. So a lot of deportation were done from Compiègne. And uh, the Jews were first forbidden to own any business, and any business that was owned by a Jewish family was confiscated and given away to a, uh, a, to a collaborator, a French collaborator. The French administration, as well as the police, collaborated 110% uh, with the, uh, the Germans, with the SS, and uh, every day there was uh, something new. The Jews could not go to a park, they could not go to a restaurant, they could not uh, go to a cinema, they could not uh, work, they could not go to school uh, beyond the uh, grammar school. Uh, they couldn't own telephone, they couldn't move from one building to another, they couldn't even move uh, within one floor or to another in the, the same building until that very infamous uh, day of uh, July 19, 1942, when uh, two uh, French uh, gendarmes came, and three of them were posted actually at the bottom of our building, and decided uh, to ask my parents to follow them to the police station, not giving them any explanation why. Uh, they went there and... Uh, uh, we never saw them back after that, but at the same time, the commotion uh, caused uh, by this uh, very early arrest at five in the morning on a beautiful Sunday of July 1942, uh, just uh, woke our neighbors and they came up, a Christian couple, Monsieur and Madame Henri and Suzanne Riboulot, 
and asked what was going on. And her parents were just going crazy because they were arrested. They didn't know when they would come back, if they would come back. And they didn't know what to do with my sister, who was at the time nine and I was four and a half. And um, Henri uh, Riboulot pronounced those a few words that uh, really saved our lives. And he said, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Malmet, do not worry that uh, your children will be fine with us until you return. Probably thinking that they would come back the same day or just uh, for uh, paper, whatever. And they never came back. And uh, then we moved actually with this wonderful family. And for the next uh, three years, we were hidden by the family at the risk of their lives and the lives of their two sons, uh, René, uh, who was at the time 19, and Marcel, who was uh, 16. And uh, life uh, went on. Of course, the, the, the food was a real problem that uh, for the fact that I've Leon, never seen a Leon, I, Leon, I don't want to um, interrupt. I just, I, 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 you have a tremendous story and it, all of this is in your book which is right. called what? So the book is called, We Survived At Last I Speak. In fact, that uh, here is the, uh, the, the the page of the book, if I can Perfect. focus it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We That's Survived At Last I Speak. It's available in uh, English, in French, and in Spanish. So yeah. the, and so the, the amazing thing was about this family who took Leon and his sister in, and we're going to get into some more of that. So, Leon, hold some more of what you were, the direction we're going into. I want to ask Jack to come on and share a, a bit about his background so that we can tie it all in. So, Jack? Yeah, I'm ready for it. Um, yes, unlike uh, Leon and many other people, um, our phones and radios and businesses were not uh, confiscated for the simple reason we didn't have any. I come from a very, very poor family uh, in a small uh, town called Pulavi uh, between um, uh, Lublin and uh, Warsaw. And um, my story, as you know, and uh, that's um, many other people know from um, my book, uh, Child of the Holocaust, uh, is about the day that uh, I came home to uh, this little town where we were living at the time and uh, found everyone gone. Uh, my mother, my little brother Yassel, and my uncle Shepsel uh, had been uh, taken away with uh, the rest of the Jews of the town the night before. And so um, uh, I was alone. I was at that stage nine going on 10. And the woman that I was working for on a farm, a Ukrainian lady, uh, took me back and she said, she'll be, she'll look after me. And um, she did. Uh, I worked on the farm and uh, eventually, unfortunately, um, um, the a decree came out where um, uh, the decree said that uh, Jews were not allowed to work uh, for uh, non-Jews anymore. And uh, anyone employing a Jew had to bring the person to the Gestapo. Uh, she, of course, uh, didn't uh, want to do that, uh, but uh, she at the same time could not keep me anymore. And uh, so at that stage, uh, I was uh, asked to leave. Uh, everyone cried, of course, uh, throwing me out. Um, and it so happened that be just before that, I connected with another uncle of mine who I was uh, at that stage, maybe 10. He was 13, but he was my uncle, uh, was my mother's youngest brother. And he, too, had been on a farm and he was let go. And so he came to see me. So the two of us were thrown out. And uh, we uh, lived in a haystack for a, a few days and roamed uh, the uh, uh, fields and uh, dug out uh, potatoes that were left in the earth. And we 
had the fires going and baked potatoes. But after a little while, uh, my uncle Moshe, that was his name, uh, became very despondent and uh, he felt that uh, there wasn't much chance of us surviving. He said, let's give ourselves up. And he suggested we go to the city of Helm, which as you know, Helm uh, is uh, an existing town, but is part of mythology. There are stories about the fools of Helm. Uh, but the town actually exists. And he said, let's go to Helm because there's still a ghetto there. If we're going to die, let's die among our own. Um, I disagreed. He left. He went to Helm. I went the other way. And so now I was all alone. And for the next three years, I roamed uh, the countryside, a very treacherous countryside, pretending to be a Catholic orphan whose um, uh, father was on the forced labor in Germany, and I had a stepmother who beat me, and so I ran away, and now I was looking for work. And um, after the first winter, came when spring came, I actually found um, someone who hired me, and I would stay there for a while, and the game seemed to work. Um, I learned how to uh, pray. Uh, I knew all the Catholic prayers. I went to church. I pretended to know what what to read and how to behave, and I crossed myself when I ate, and so on. And after a while, those people let me go, and I went to another village and stayed there for a year. Once people became suspicious of me, I ran away, traveled some distance to another village, and uh, stayed there till the end of the war when I... Um, I uh, declared to my uh, employer that uh, the truth, that who I really was, at which point he wouldn't let me go. He said that I had uh, threatened his family's life. If I had been discovered, their farm would have been burned and uh, they would have all been killed. Uh, so I had to escape from there. I ran to the city of Lublin where survivors were congregating. They come back, and there I was placed in an orphanage. And uh, uh, from the orphanage, uh, we were moved to another part of the country, to another orphanage. And eventually, I joined a Zionist organization called Hashomer Hatzair, and I was smuggled out of um, um, Poland. Jack. Okay, hold it. Okay, I don't want to interrupt, but again, I want you to just show show your book, and now you have a second book. So why don't you show both of your? Do you have both of them handy? Uh, well, I I have them if you if if I can go to my uh, yeah. yeah yeah let's go do that. Uh, I what I should yeah. tell you yeah. is that the my first book is out of print in the United States, though you can find uh, find it in the library, and you can find it on. Uh, uh, eBay and uh, so forth and Amazon, but uh, we are just signing a contract with Penguin, and that there's going to be the book is considered a classic now. It's been around since 1967, and uh, so um, the new edition, which will be coming out this year uh, in North America, that is Canada and United States, uh, will be published by Penguin. That's great. And uh, yeah, okay, terrific. The, That's wonderful. The, the, so these um, stories, and I just want to also yeah. say, as far as Jack is concerned, um, uh, so that will be coming out in a heart in a paperback okay. by Penguin as well. Hold as, up your book, Jack. Hold up. Yeah, your book. here's. Um, okay, hold yeah, here's. Uh, bring the, it yeah. over to your uh, left. There we go. A little bit to your left. There we go. Oh, All right. So I listen. Well? I just. I also. Um, yeah. These stories. You just get their books. You'll be you'll be yeah, in There you go. There there you go. The, Perfect. That was the last Canadian edition. Okay. It's available in about a dozen different languages as Thank well. You. Okay. And, I want Jack uh, tell everybody the, about Amnon. How you so here's the second book where Amnon is uh, mentioned. I think. So you uh, met Amnon. You end up in Israel later on in life. And yeah, you Amnon, love that story. My producer <laughs> is. Go ahead. My producer is hitchhiking. Go ahead. What happened? Yeah, Amnon, Amnon was out of the army by then, but he, he wore an army uniform 
And when I, I had bought a car when we were in Israel, so whenever I traveled, uh, soldiers would be uh, hitchhiking, and I felt that uh, I, I should give him a lift. So whenever I saw, saw a soldier, I would stop the car. So one night I stopped the car for Amnon. It was Amnon, right? And so, yeah, so, so, car. yes. And then Amnon connected me to Jack. And that's how this piece with Jack came to being. But now, yeah. so these stories are intense. But, but part of what I want to do today, or a big part of what I want to do today, is talk about the inspiration from these from these stories and each of my guests um in some way had to in some way pretend and be part of a pretense in order to survive but that doesn't have to be a bad thing so sometimes we have to pretend to be something to be it so i want to go back to i want to thank all of you very much so far and i want to go back to gabriella and gabriella i want you to bring it around to what you're doing now and how you're using your story as inspiration. Right now, I go, I'm going into libraries. I'm invited to quite a lot of, um, what can I say, leaders of society to give talks to different clubs. And it gives me a new life. I feel that I'm inspired just by being able to share this incredible woman's life and how she survived the Holocaust. Yes, she did pretend to be a non-Jewish, but in a very, very clever way, very dangerous, but very right. clever way. So what do you know? Yeah. So from, from this pretense, what is your, what do you know about this kind of a message? Not necessarily the detail of what your mother did, but about the the you know the the philosophy or you know what what's the what do you get from that from what your mother did what's the message I think that, well the main message from from what I understand is it's survival this incredible intention that yes I am going to survive and there was no she had this incredible vision that there was nothing that would stop her from surviving. And she did. And also the book also goes into communism, which was just as bad as, uh, as the Holocaust. And she survived through all of it just by having this amazing intention that yes, she can survive and she will never show fear. And I think that is mainly the message that I want to pass on. That's my thing, that that's what the main part of the book is and that's my life right now it is my reason for living to pass this message i think it's so very very important in today's world to let the young people know the schools know the children are brought up in this the world is going so crazy that unless you have a goal of for your own that you know what you want in life, it will protect you and you will survive. And that is the message that I want to pass along. It's, to me, it's, it's vital that I do that. And so how have you learned to survive? Have you had to survive? In the beginning, no. It was uh, because of her ability, I never had a problem. Unfortunately, I didn't appreciate it. I didn't appreciate what I was given. And I squandered most of it. And interestingly enough, when, I, when there was nothing left, I looked at it and I looked at my mother's life and realized that the gift wasn't the money. It wasn't the fortune. It was the ability to gain it. It was the ability to live life in a different way. And since then in my life has totally changed. It's what I want to do and I'm having a ball. Literally, it's like a new life. And I'm totally, totally satisfied with my life at the moment. It's wonderful. Thank you for that. So, That's quite so, all right. Leon. It was a trial, but it what? was, you know, it was, you, I think I have to hit that bottom. 
before I realized because I was just such a spoiled child. It was totally, totally spoiled. I had no idea of what what life was about because everything was given to me on a plate. So you and didn't then, know you didn't know how you were actually living a life of of a survivor. Surviving. No, no, I had totally. I was so protected, and everything was given to me. So I had no idea of what it was. I knew it because I watched her during the, her lifetime, and I could see. And I thought it was absolutely magical. Some of the things that she did it was just unbelievable. That she could confront people and never have that fear. But her, her father did tell her never show fear, and you could see it. She never showed fear. She handled. It was just such an, an incredible thing to watch. But I never. It was because I was protected, except for one time. And again, it was only minutes when the in the Russian Gestapo came to question me, and within seconds, everyone else was scared. But then she walked waltzed into the room and said, you put that child down. And the man just looked at her and he did. It was just to me that was basically that was a turning point of me watching her all the time. But the rest of it that was all given to me, it was just, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's what it is. Yeah, I can have chocolate and I can have oranges. And yeah, I can see people standing in line, but I don't have to do that. Yeah, I can have clothes. I can have whatever I want. I never realized until a lot later in life that what it what she went through to mm. actually obtain those things right. and what it cost her to obtain those. Things. She lived. She lived in a way, in a way that we look at, and, we, look and, at and, and we can say she lived above this level of fear, level. which is very fascinating. And I and I highly recommend that you. You read Gabrielle's book because it is it's you've got to put yourself in a in a completely different somewhat of a mindset of a heart set to see oh yeah I mean instead because we could look at this story of Gabrielle's and say hmm we can be a little judgmental but when you really look yeah. at it and you apply yourself you can see the possibilities and how that could be the same for you in your life it's very interesting so I, 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 it, I want to get into this some more. So thank you, Gabrielle, for sharing that. And I want to go to Leon now. So Leon, you too had to survive. And you too had to come up with your personal mission, movement. And instead of finding, instead of being in a state of anger, you found gratitude. Could you talk some about all of this? And certainly after living uh, three years in fear and uh, hunger of being denounced and uh, came within minutes of being arrested by the Gestapo at, uh, when I was uh, seven. Uh, after that, I didn't want anything to do with uh, being Jewish for many years, decades actually, anything that uh, no one even knew that I was Jewish. No one even knew that I was a Holocaust survivor for 60 years. So it took me a long time to uncork that uh, bottle that uh, I had sealed, uh, I thought, forever. About uh, 10 years ago, though, uh, because of my assistance, insistence, I started to talk. So today, I have found actually a relief uh, when I was younger in education. Uh, education uh, to me was really the, the freedom. So I graduated in mechanical engineering from the University of, uh, of Paris. And uh, then I just continued uh, to uh, continued with my education. And when I came to this country, uh, to Stanford at a business school and so on. So uh, that experience, uh, gave me, uh, uh, gave me the the will to resist unfairness, uh, the will to uh, educate myself and prove actually to myself that yes, you can do it. 
uh, I was involved in Silicon Valley in about five startups, and uh, fortunately, they were successful. So it is uh, it is quite important. I've had a few setbacks in life that uh, we lost actually a uh, a child uh, about three three days after birth. Then uh, a few years later, my wife decided that she wanted her freedom, and uh, there were of course uh, I would say setbacks, and uh, I was able to survive them. And uh, every time I was able to do better. And until I met my uh, second wife, which was actually uh, just a lifesaver for me. And we now have been married for 38 years. But I passed on the same resistance to adversity to my children and also to my colleagues, uh, the colleagues that I worked uh, with. So it is quite important that we do understand in this very tumultuous world today uh, that uh, we have to be careful and we have to resist actually anyone who claims that uh, like Hitler did uh, Deutschland Huber uh, that uh, those kind of people really scare me and uh, I do speak uh, now for the last 10 years she into schools universities synagogues churches and uh, all kinds of surrounding mm -hmm. uh, organizations. So it has been extremely, um, extremely useful to me. And also the reason I didn't speak for 60 years, first, it was too emotional to speak about it. And even to this day, I'm very emotional when I speak about it. Certain uh, images just pop up and uh, make me feel uh, uncomfortable and uh, almost cry so which you know men do not cry so <laughs> i break that rule but uh, i also the other reason why i didn't speak and i didn't think that people would be interested there have been so many holocaust stories so many books written about it but i do find that every story is different every story is different and i've learned something about every story and i do encourage I said the people I talk to, uh, to read uh, these stories. And I find that people are extremely, extremely interested. And lately, they are even more interested than they have been in the past. Thank you, uh, Leon. I, it's, it, you know, Leon was, you know, th these stories of surviving and survival. I mean, you, my guests take it to a whole nother level. And I guess that's so much for what, you know, when I sit back and I woke up today or I wake up any day and I might feel a little yuck and you, you listen to these stories and you go, oh, my goodness. And how old is your sister, Leon? My sister is uh, 85 and uh, she's gone through the same process as I have. The fact that uh, she still dances, actually, and she does competitive dancing at the age of uh, 85. And uh, she's just uh, always has, has a wonderful spirit. And she is the one who's been talking to audiences for many, many years. And that's how I started. She, mm -hmm. uh, as I was, uh, I live on the West Coast. She lives on the East Coast in New York, in Wonsley, New York. And uh, she invited me to one of these, uh, or her talk. And uh, people started to ask me questions. And I saw that, uh, yes, people were interested. People are interested. And I just needed yes. to do that. So that's what yep. prompted me to well, start. This is this is living this is like this is a living history and it's and and for me it it, it it's, it's all it is about the holocaust but it, i'm fascinated by what individuals can do in the face of the most disgusting horrific things and so um thank you for sharing that we're going to come back to you in a minute um leon but i want to go to jack Jack, what does being a survivor mean to you? Um, I I have never been comfortable with that uh, term, uh, Holocaust survivor. In fact, I'm rather critical of others who um, use it as if uh, it's some kind of medal that they were awarded. Uh, when you go to a cemetery now, you see uh, on the gravestones inscribed the person's name and underneath, it says Holocaust survivor. Or if you see 
an announcement in the paper that someone had passed away. And, and there it again, it says Holocaust survivor. It's as if there were some, some heroes of sorts. Um, I think that having survived um, had a lot to do with luck. No matter how a person behaved or how smart they were, there were others smarter who didn't make it. So intelligence had nothing to do with it. Uh, I think most of it had to do with just simply being lucky. In terms of um, what one does with that kind of experience, in my own case, I, uh, I was involved in the arts. Uh, that's all I studied. I studied uh, to be uh, an artist, a graphic artist, a commercial artist. And uh, I spent many years working in television uh, as a graphic designer and uh, later as uh, the head of the graphic design in uh, Canadian television. Um, I later started writing and I wrote plays dealing with the subject. But in my graphic work, I also expressed, I believe, um, the things that interested me, things that I knew that affected me. And so if you look at my graphic work, um, they're almost uh, pictures of, uh, of that experience. There's a lot of um, figures running usually in a field. Um, later, I... Um, a turn to um, to uh, uh, filmmaking, and uh, I made uh, about a half a dozen films. Each one of them uh, concerns the Holocaust, um, and, and so that's that was one. So, Jack, way when you say me. when you say people in the field or the movies that you did that that had something to do with the Holocaust, was there an overall theme that you wanted to express? Because obviously, as an artist, you have stuff to express so was there something well, you wanted to express well you know i wanted to express i think what most survivors want to express they want to, to say look what was done to us look what how people behaved and look uh, how um um uh how defenseless we were uh and what they did with us uh, I should tell you that at this stage in my life, I am not sure that having written books on it, having written plays and made films on it, and having spoken to groups, that in fact, this does any good. I don't think that that is the real education of the Holocaust. We think that if we go to speak to a group of people and tell them what happened to us, that they somehow will... Uh, change their minds or, or become better people and say, isn't that terrible? We would never do that. Uh, I sometimes think that telling them these stories, um, they uh, it gives them ideas what to do with us rather than feel any empathy. Uh, I think that um, if you look at most books, certainly most feature films, including Schindler's List and so on, does not really address the problem of the Holocaust, it in fact uh, shows how weak we were, how um, uh, they could do whatever they wanted with us and, and we did very little uh, about it. So that there were no heroes among us in these stories. There, there are no uh, heroes in these films. If you look at Schind Schindler's List, it's a German industrialist who took advantage of um, a free um, a slave labor, uh, who was the hero, uh, so that the the general world can identify with them. They do not identify with the Jews in the film. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I can't think of one film where the Jew is the hero of his survival. It's usually somebody else. I uh, when I watch these things, I think to myself how unlucky I was that. Uh, no one came to my rescue. I somehow had to do this on my own. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a part, there's so much of what you're saying that has so much validity to it that I could Thank sit you. here. You're welcome. I could sit here and say, I agree. But then there's parts of what you're saying that 
I sit and I have to reflect on because I'm not sure. When you say, and I, as far as survivors and not being a hero, I can understand that. But maybe it's more about what you're doing now and the message because, like Leon said, more people are interested in these stories of Holocaust survivors today. That's what he's finding. Uh, um, I think there's some tie-in between... I, Go ahead, Jack. I, I agree that people are interested. Um, the same way people are interested in adventure stories. They're interested to see how someone survived under terrible conditions. You, That's a natural so you, thing to be interested in. So you in. don't think people are learning? change their mind. That's my point. Oh. Do, do they become better people as a result of it? I don't think so. You don't. No. So the people that but helped you, that, so what what about the people that helped you or somewhat helped you along the way that protect protected you a little bit along the way? Did they did not protect that nobody protected you a little bit or lied for you along the way or took you in? Uh, I mean, there were good people and there were bad people, sure. Uh, but overall. No one took me in and said, I know you're a Jew and I will, uh, I will keep you here. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that there were not situations like that. There were instances, of mm -hmm. course, and there were some good people along the way. But I, I felt I was the hero of my own, of my yeah. own life. See, and that I'm learning, yes. And I think that your without, message and Leon's message and Gabriella's message, I think you know, it's history will re is going to repeat itself and repeat itself and repeat itself in some ways. That's why we need you to talk. We need okay. you to be honest, Jack. We need you to be honest, Leon. We need you to be honest, Gabriella, about your experiences so that you well, touch our hearts. Go ahead. You know, I don't know whether this happens in the United States or Australia, but in Toronto, Canada, where I live, once a, a year, there is Holocaust Education Week. And a very large brochure is published and spread around. And they, during that week, there are speakers uh, in every church, in every synagogue, in the libraries, uh, and organizations, and so forth. And they get uh, survivors to come up and speak and tell their stories. And uh, they think they do a marvelous job and it's ironic from to me that it's called Holocaust Education Week. All it is really is a a, a stage to tell your sad story, and uh, and people come and listen to it and applaud. Uh, what is the education? If you if you say Holocaust education, you have to say what did we learn from the Holocaust? And this late this. Late in life, for me, what I've learned and the, the conclusion that I've come to is that we allowed ourselves, we allowed it to happen to us. When I was growing up, I was uh, maybe six years old, during the holiday of Purim, where you get made up and you wear a mask. Uh, I made myself a mask out of a piece of cardboard, and I went from door to door and uh, uh, and sang a song, and people would give me pennies. When I was on my way home, a uh, Polish kid started chasing me, yelling, uh, Jew to Palestine, and started throwing stones at me. I ran as fast as I could. I came home. And I told my parents what had happened, and my father said that that, that was a good thing that you ran away. Mm -hmm. You should have really said you should have stood up right, and fought right, him. Right. And right, that was our, right, that I right, think right, was right, part of our right. problem. I think you're. That I the think, education yes, of yes. the Holocaust should be that we we should get instead of perhaps writing more books and making more films, we should go and take lessons how to use a rifle and a gun. <laughs> Wow. Hold on. That's why we started the Breaking Free Show is so you that we wouldn't that. stand here and just take it. However, hold on. I mean, that's a strong message. And I, Leon, I want to hear from you, too. And then I want to talk to Gabrielle because you opened it up with saying people want to hear. 
what are what why do people want to hear and what are you telling them and what do you think about what jack just said i have to go back actually to the war time in our small town of eighteen thousand people there must have been at least a thousand people who knew that we were hidden uh, across the street from us there was a, a farmer he was dutch and every night we were to the farm, my sister and I, to get some milk. And every, almost every night, uh, he was at the table in the same room as we we're getting our milk and uh, drinking uh, red face and so on with uh, German soldiers. Apparently, they never denounced us. Across the street, there was a, a lady she, in her 30s, and uh, she had a lover. He was a uh, German officer. He was uh, brought uh, almost every night uh, by a chauffeur to her apartment. But I'm talking about across the street, and that street was probably 20 feet wide. And uh, apparently, she never denounced us. All our teachers, uh, and of course, for three years, I went to school about 20% of the time because we were in hiding. And uh, at times, we were in just uh, open hiding uh, but we were never denounced so i think that all those people they risked their lives in especially in our streets and they were heroes whenever i talk that uh, lots of people said i i did not know uh, and yes uh, jack i am also invited <laughs> during that uh, week uh, of uh, of the Holocaust Memorial once a year in schools and colleges and universities and so on to speak. And uh, the people uh, keep uh, are interested. And so the, the, the question is that in the town where I live, that, that I often ask myself the same question, how come we didn't resist? But I have to say that the Germans were very, very smart very smart in propaganda in the way they went about it they first arrested my parents and not us why did they arrest my parents first because they were not french because they were uh, still polish and you know in this country now that we have this immigration thing here and i feel the very same resonance that i learned uh, when i became an adult about what happened during the holocaust is that whereby uh, people didn't resist uh, the arrest of uh, foreign people why because they were taking the job from other people because they were taking the money because they were profiteering or whatever but then it took at least a year or two before they start to arrest French Jews. So they did not uh, immediately uh, arrest uh, the people. It was, it was actually impossible to resist. And I completely agree with you that resistance is very important. And uh, if I saw that, I would also be ready, yes, to. I, I am completely against guns and NRA and so on, but I would not hesitate to take actually uh, guns. And uh, the only time I held a gun was when I spent almost three years in the French Air Force. And I have no desire to ever touch a gun again. But I, uh, I am of the opinion that, yes, we must resist and we must educate. So in our little infinitesimal way that we can educate the the youth and uh, we should do it i don't know what else uh, we can do at uh, at this time as one thing is that for 60 years i didn't want anyone to know that i was a jew and today i have no problem saying i'm jewish i'm not proud of being jewish there's no reason to be proud of being catholic or jewish or muslim or whatever we are what we are and for most of us 99.9 percent .9%, uh, we are what our parents were we didn't decide to be a certain race or religion or a certain family of the people. So that's the way I, I do feel about it. And uh, I think that uh, we need to make sure that we resist uh, any sign of uh, getting into the same process as we have seen 70 years ago. So, so it so it's about speaking up it's about not standing back it's about voicing you who you are what you are what you believe in and not allowing 
anybody to take that away from you. That's what I'm hearing. Absolutely. So, so absolutely. absolutely. So, Gabrielle, what are you thinking? Well, what I was thinking, I was listening to Jack, and I can see all the horrible things that and the trials that he went through. It must have been for a child of that age, and I have grandchildren of that age. It must have been absolutely horrendous. But I do not believe that it's luck. I do not believe there's such a thing as luck. I believe that there's an intention. And if you have an intention, doors will open. It's to me, and from what I've been doing and living and seeing, that I think the most important thing is that you have an intention to do something. And when you have that intention, this is not a new theory. This is goes back from what I've read from Goethe and from a lot of other philosophers. It is, if you have an intention, it will come through. It's not luck. We do not make our own. Yeah, luck comes into it once we have what we know what we want and we have a clear picture of what we want. Nothing will stand in the way. And that's, that's my, it's not even a belief. It's like my mother's bubble. And I think that maybe from that I am in a bubble because of it. You know, you I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm listening to the three of you and um, I'm just, it, it's hard to put into words some of or, or summarize or conceptualize the kinds of things that you're talking about because they're, they're so real. And when I, when I take pieces of what you're all saying, and, and Jack, you, had, you have a very powerful point. But I think sometimes we have to look at how we're fighting back and are we. And you did fight back. You did some brilliant things to survive. I mean, for a kid of nine, the things that you did, whether it was, you know, it was just, I don't know where you got it from. And I don't, and I don't believe it was luck. I think, you know, it was a God-given thing that you survived, that you came here today, that you survived at nine. You can come here and say this because we do need to speak up. We do need to resist. We do need ha to have the intention to resist. Without the intention, we don't know. We're just going to be a bunch of doormats. You I mean, know, everybody, go ahead. I was going to say that uh, this whole conversation reminds me of a um, uh, uh, few years back during this uh, Holocaust Education Week. I was asked to speak at a, a church here in Toronto. And uh, I uh, asked the um, minister, I said, how many people would do you think would attend? He said, probably about 40 or 50. I said, you know, I said, I don't want to speak to a small crowd. Uh, he said, well, how about, he said, if, uh, you come and speak on Sunday, and uh, you do the sermon. Uh, and then the full congregation will be there, about two, three hundred people. I said, great. So I went, and uh, I told them uh, my story and, and so forth. And, uh, uh, and afterwards, I um, sat at the table, and I was signing books. And a Jewish woman came over, and she said, you know, she said, I've read your book, and I came from far away to hear you speak, and uh, I'm very, very disappointed in you. I said, really? I'd like to know why. She said, I expected you to give those Polish peasants hell for what they did to you. And she said, you were really good, very kind. I said, well, thank you for your opinion, and so on. The next day... The minister called me to thank me for uh, having come. And I said, uh, were you satisfied with uh, the, the sermon I gave? He said, frankly, no. I said, why is that? He said, I expected you to um, say nice things about the people who helped you. I thought you were going to say how the Christians saved you. Instead, he said, you, um, you did the opposite. So there you have two, two different uh, opinions on, on reality. Yeah. Uh, it's, reality is not 
is not very popular, certainly not in the American, North American culture. In North American culture, you have to be very hopeful, you have to be uh, uh, very um, uh, kind uh, and uh, show that uh, very much what uh, uh, is in Anne Frank's book, that uh, after all, in spite of everything, people are good at heart. It isn't true. It isn't true. Some people are. Uh, certainly what Leon describes about people in this village and knowing that he was Jewish and didn't uh, renounce him. But um, if you look at the at history to see what really took place, you see the fact that um, uh, people did denounce Jews, that many Poles uh, would take money from Jews to hide them, and after the money was gone, they killed them. Um, even today, uh, the, as this past week or yesterday, the um, Polish government, uh, I'm sure you've, you've heard of this, the Polish government has um, propagated a, a new law that you cannot say that Poles collaborated with the Germans or that Poles killed Jews. You're not allowed to say that. You'll go to jail for three years. Um, so there you are. Uh, I, I come back to, um, uh, to my... Um, uh, opinion earlier that uh, uh, the, the only thing that we should really learn from it is that in a jungle, you don't walk in a jungle carrying the Torah. You carry the Torah in one arm, but in the other arm, you better carry a Nuzi. Well, you know what? Um, a, a really great uh, um, author that I really like. Um, God knows. I can't think of what his name is. But he's, he was brilliant. He was he's brilliant. Wayne Dyer. He's 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 died. He's dead. But he said sometimes you have to cut out the cancer. Sometimes you have to do something that may not always be sitting in the hope and the positive and the and the frilly. And sometimes you have to take drastic measures and sometimes you have to cut out the cancer. So, you know, I don't know what to say. I'm my first inclination is not to pick up a gun. I don't think you fight fire. I but I think we should I think we have to resist. I think we don't just sit back and take what somebody says as being right when it when we know it's wrong. I don't think we should sit back and just accept. I mean, whether it's whatever it is. I I think if we feel a certain way, we have a right to speak up and we have a right to become a community of people to speak up. But I don't know what to say in relationship what you just said. I didn't experience what you experienced. I don't have that history. I don't have Leon's history. I don't have Gabriella's history. I can't. All I can all I can do is say, you know, let's break free. I don't think Mar it's with a gun, but you know. Marilyn, I think that what you're expressing and what Leon has expressed are Jewish ideals. It's uh, Jewish culture. Uh, that's what we are taught. That's what the Talmud teaches. That's what the Torah teaches about turning the other cheek to be good to the neighbor, to the stranger, and uh, to be a kind person, to do charity work. These are Jewish ideas, and and that and those Jewish ideas were a downfall because the rest of the world was not like that. How what about now, deal? Jack? Jack, what about now? What about now exactly? What about now? What about so so let me ask you something. What you're saying in 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 a lot of ways is true. I don't I'm I'm not living it. I don't see it face to face. I'm only going by hearsay and you know what other what I might make up. So 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 let me ask you these question this one question to each of so what now what? I personally when I am in Israel, when I go for a trip to Israel and I see young 18-year-old girls in uniform carrying Uzis and marching, my heart swells. I think back of 18-year-old girls in the Warsaw Ghetto who would have never been in a uniform like that. They're so proud. They're so full of vigor and hope and, and feel very much at home with themselves. Uh, the, the, the very much in their own skin. And uh, that is, 
for me, that is a victory okay. to see the fact that okay. at last, after so many thousands of years of being second and third class citizens and, and being trampled upon, we finally are standing up or those people living there are standing up, defending themselves. And uh, I think that is the lesson okay. of the Holocaust. Okay. I, and I can see, I can see feeling feeling power i can see that i can see feeling power and what that can mean whether you're holding a gun you're holding a knife or you're holding a baby i can see that so ho hold on one second go ahead i'm done i just i just wanted to add that when jack was in israel and we were talking jack told me something that i always think about and tell people about and I didn't understand it back then. Jack was saying, it is very nice, and this is exactly what he was just saying. He says, it is very nice to see you. I'm envious of you. Somebody calls you a Jew, you put your head up. We were growing up, if somebody said Jew, we put our head down. That being able to put your head up as an Israeli did not come because we were nice to the people that were attacking us. It's because yeah. we did have a gun in our hand exactly. and we had a bunch of guns. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, so Leon. Well, uh, I, uh, I agree with many things that uh, Jack is uh, talking about uh, the, uh, where I would actually differ that I certainly never term the other cheek, and I do not uh, subscribe to that uh, methodology of uh, defending ourselves. Never, never turn the other cheek. Uh, whatever the Bible says, whatever the Torah says, I don't care. That I do not uh, turn the other cheek. It's, it's quite important to understand that. Uh, also, I would say that uh, luck has uh, quite a bit to do. In fact. Um, I'm here today talking to you because I am lucky in two instances, and uh, we don't have enough time, I guess, for me to relate what the two instances were during the war. But uh, I, Leon, no go, Leon, why. Leon, Amman yes. said, "Tell the story, tell it," because we okay. have some. He's we'll give. Yeah, we'll have yeah. time. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. So the the, the first one is that. Uh, the same day that uh, in 19 November of 1904, uh, by then uh, they didn't rely on the French police. The French police had kind of uh, turned the other way. Uh, but uh, they uh, did the arrest themselves. And uh, they came to arrest uh, the few remaining Jews. In fact, that at the end of the war, of about 600 Jews living in our small town, my sister and I were the only survivors left uh, in the town who had to spend the whole time in uh, Compiègne. And uh, my uh, foster mother, I call her my foster mother, although we never got, uh, it was never legal, uh, that uh, she saw the truck arresting our cousin, Charlot. He was a year younger and uh, she was on a bicycle coming from uh, work and she just, uh, came as fast as she could, uh, screaming as she was going up the stairs, escape, escape. So I did, a, I knew the drill. I went and I jumped over the wall. And as the truck was turning, in fact, I was in a garden running. I heard the SS uh, screaming, uh, uh, Malmed, Malmed, uh, come and see here. So uh, we escaped. Now, uh, my... My foster father, Henri, was uh, a fisherman, and in those days, since we didn't have any food, he was going to try to get uh, some uh, some fish in the river uh, by. And there was a spot where the blood of uh, the place where they were killing uh, animals uh, was uh, flowing into the river. And there was a German in civilian soldiers and uh, civilian uh, clothes who spoke very good English. And he asked uh, a few times before he spoke to uh, Papa Henri and he asked what his name was. 
and he says, well, uh, one time he says, whenever you, if you are ever in need of something, just come and see me. So we, I guess they couldn't stand anymore that it was just terrible to think that we would be arrested uh, any day. So he went to see him, not knowing who he was. So he came into the commandanture and he asked for the name that all he knew was the name. And he was introduced in his very large office and there were a few people, uh, secretaries uh, working there. And this person behind the desk was in uh, civilian clothes, in the civilian in military SS clothes. And he was actually the SS uh, commander of the town. And he said, uh, Monsieur Ibolo, I know who you are, and I know that you are hiding two Jewish children. And of course, Papa Henri almost uh, died on the spot when he found out uh, whom he was talking to. And uh, that uh, commander said, uh, that uh, Führer said, uh, do not worry, Mr. Ibolo, for as long as I'm here, that I will, uh, I will protect you. And uh from that time on for just a few months actually until the liberation of our town and that they never came back to arrest us so was it luck i think it was whatever that you're very religious you can think it's a miracle i don't believe in miracles uh, so i think it is luck so luck has had to do something uh with it uh it's, it's well, something very but this, I, I, this, I always say, you know, the, uh, somehow, since the very beginning, the first war actually was record, uh, recorded was 14,000 years ago, and it was in uh, North Africa. And uh, somehow, we've seen wars, it's not going to go away because it is in the nature of men to have war. You know, the children, they just, uh, men, I uh, mean, young boys just love love uh, guns that that's what they so it is it is with us it will always be there always be there maybe so, so i always conclude by saying that uh the evil i mean goodness always prevailed over evil although it has taken a lot of lives in the process mm. but there's nothing much that we can do to prevent it except to resist and not to be afraid to speak up. That was a that was a mouthful, Leon. Thank you for that story too. And you know, I'm not and I are looking at each other and go, and our eyes are like with each of you. My eyes are going up and kind of with I'm non silently acknowledging everything that you're saying, uh, Gabriella. Yes. What do you think? Now your I... mother, your mother resisted in a different way. Yes. And to me, that's better than a gun. Because if you use your, if you look at it, there's always two ways. You can either resist or you can be smarter and look out and see what you can do. And I think there was a very old Chinese saying that the wind, the, the, uh, the crop bends with the wheat. It bends with the, 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 the wind. And if you, if it's anything that's straight, it, it, it can get cut down. And if you, you have to act smart, it's always, and that's an individual's ability. And we all have it within us. It's inherent to every human being. And if you use our intelligence, I think it's better off on than using a gun. I disagree with guns totally. But I can also see Jack's viewpoint. And yes, being in Israel, and those kids out there, it's amazing. And I do take my hat off to them. But I don't think my mother was ever, she was always proud to be Jewish. The first thing she did after the Holocaust was buy herself. That's under communism. She had a gold star. And she would never, ever take it off until the day she died. Mm -hmm. So I don't think she wasn't, she was a very proud Jew. But at the same time, she also was very, very smart. There's always a road. Mm -hmm. there's, there was another saying, next every door that closes, another one will open. And you can always use the door that opens. And to me, that's that's the lesson one needs to learn. No matter what happens in your life, and I'm sure you, all of you have 
changes in your life, there's always another door. You always can follow a different way, a different path, and make your own luck. I don't think luck luck is made. It's, we make it. So, and we make it with us. Right. As our intention. I don't think there's such a thing as luck. I think we make our luck. And I can see how it can be done. Mm -hmm. And the other saying that my, my grandfather used to say, yeah, these three proverbs that were part of the magic bubble and it was like a whole thing. Mm -hmm. And the other one was the streets are paved with gold. You only have to know how to pick it up. And I think in today's world, we just need to teach our children and anyone around us how to pick that gold up, how not to be afraid. How, it's not that you're not afraid, you don't show the fear. And I think that's how one survives. I cannot see another way of surviving because it's just the way it is. That is the truth and that is life. There will always be people that want to, the worst for you. But then there's always among them, there's a lot of people that will help. And I think you just need to find the people that will help. And you yourself, your own spirit, your own beingness will find those people that will help mm -hmm. and who are like-minded. That's just, I don't even think it's a belief for me. I just know it's a fact. And I've lived that now for the last, what, 10 years? Mm -hmm. Before that, I was just, didn't know what I was doing. Just doing, just getting everything that I was given to me. But for the last 10 years, I, and the more I, the more I live this life, the more I can see how it works and how much truth is in that. And you need to find the real truth in life. That's what it's about. We have to figure we out, have to figure we have to figure out, out how we speak out. up, how we resist, how we share our voice. And it's not, a, it's not about not doing it. It is about doing it. And each one of my guests today have opened up a lot of cans that I did not expect to be opened, but that's all part of free will, free speech. Yeah. And that's all part of breaking free is to be able to share your truth. And I love what each and every one of my, my um, guests have brought to the, to the show today and to the table, because it, you know what? It's food for thought and we cannot sit back and just say it should be this way or that way. So, each of them have a, a book out on Amazon. Go ahead, Gabrielle, tell us your book real quick. Oh, well, that's my book. That's the new cover for the book. And now uh, I've had this book on Amazon now for four years, and it has never stopped being a bestseller. Terrific. It's just there, there, and there. And thank you. This year is the year that I actually want to do more and do more public speaking about it because I feel like that thank I just want to let others know that I think. It's more important to inspire people than tell them about what what has been done to me. No, what I can I do? What can I do for others? It's Terrific. not what I can do. Thank That's you. Me. That's the reality. Thank you. Now, Jack, what about your book? Um, well, I um, I started telling you earlier the fact that uh, my book has been around since 1967 when it was first published by Doubleday, after 24 publishers had turned it down. And it's been in print ever since in about a dozen languages now. And the latest is that uh, there's a new edition coming out with photographs this time. And uh, also there will be one uh, for a voice, that is, it will be a, an audio book, as well as on, um, on uh, uh, an ebook, um, so it's a big event for me. Uh, it uh, it's, it comes on, uh, it will come out uh, under the Penguin Classic editions. Uh, so um, anyone who um, has not read the book will be able to get a new copy. Uh, but in the meantime, you can find it in all your libraries and uh, certainly on the internet. Perfect. Um, the uh, business with uh, luck. Uh, that um, uh, Gabriel was talking about. Um, I do believe in, in luck. For example, if you, if you 
are a careful person and you're crossing um, a thoroughfare and the light is green uh, and you make it, uh, that's you say, well, I, I crossed on a green light. But uh, there are many times when people can cross on a, a green light and get hit by a car. Uh, so um, lucky is the person who uh, who doesn't. I, I strongly believe in luck. Certainly in my own case, I, I believe that uh, had I turned left instead of right, I wouldn't be here today in many instances. Well, I think that's another, um, I think that's a whole nother show in talking about the difference between luck and the hand of the universe or God or some spiritual being. But or or what? Or fate. I like that. So okay. uh, thank you, Jack. Leon, what about your book? Well, my book has been uh, approximately five thousand uh well, it's always difficult. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So about five thousand uh, editions have been uh, sold and it is available also on audio dot uh, on audible. Uh, it's uh, I recorded it. it took me 100 hours actually to record it so it's a big uh, job and also available in uh, in uh, kindle uh, so the i'm very pleased actually and i've received uh, many uh, feedbacks uh, from uh, readers that are absolutely wonderful as i said there are many stories and they all need to be seen and I agree with you. And I would like to share my book, which is in just one afternoon, listening to the hearts of men, because I believe as all of us that we all get to shine a light and have a voice. And the more we do that, the more we will understand each other. And the, the more together we'll be. And the more we understand each other, the more we listen to each other, the easier it gets. And also, a lot of the work that I do, I send out on emails, and I want to thank Eye Contact for being there for me, helping me, because I do like to share these shows. I do like to let people know that we're doing these incredible stories, and I do it through Eye Contact. They are my email marketing, so if you have an interest in doing email marketing, just put contact them, put Breaking Free, and you'll get a special price, and they do a lot of hand-holding, which for me is important because I do not have the time to do it all by myself. And I want the world to know about Jack, Leon, and Gabriella. So I want to thank you both, all three of you so much for being here and for sharing with us and for, you know, opening up my eyes and in some ways being a little controversial, but that's okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure we all do. So Thanks. some of us believe in one thing, but let me tell you something. Um, if somebody was attacking my children, no telling what I would do. So I'll just leave you with that. That's the way to go. I'll go back skiing. I, I, I love your, I love Leon's uh, French accent. Yeah, really. So with that, we went over, but we wanted to because, and we didn't know we were, but, but we had these three great, stories and we wanted to keep on sharing so thank you all so much for being here thank you everybody for joining us today and we will see you all next week have a wonderful week take care You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.